Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension, Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Paul Koch of the Department of Plant Pathology here at UW-Madison. Uh, he was born in Rochester, Michigan, but soon thereafter moved to Grafton, Wisconsin, where he went to high school. He got his undergraduate degree here in UW-Madison in, in horticulture and soils. He also got his master's degree here in plant pathology and his PhD here in plant pathology. Tonight he's going to be talking about something near and dear to a lot of us here in Wisconsin, and that is that lovely green apron around our houses and schools and public buildings the lawns and urban landscapes that make our place a little enjoy more enjoyable to live in and around. It's going to be talking about a greener future, strategies for developing reduced risk pest management plans for urban landscapes. Please join me in welcoming Paul Koch to Wednesday Night at the Lab. All right, thank you for the introduction, uh, Tom, and this is uh, great to be here uh, talking with everybody here tonight about some of the research and the extension that we do in my lab. I have a three-way split in my appointment. I have a 70% extension appointment, a 20% teaching, actually, and a 10% research. But just because I have a 10% research doesn't mean 10% of the time is, due, is devoted to research. Obviously, we have a lot of research uh, going on. But that extension component drives a lot of what we do, a lot of the research that we do we want to make sure that we have a direct <coughs> outreach component. So I'm looking forward to talking to you all about uh, some of the different things that, that we do in my program. Um, Tom told me this is a, a group that likes data. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in my third year. We don't have a lot of data to present to you in my third year, so we'll talk some uh, general data from EPA uh, tests that have been done, and then we'll get into some more of uh, some of our targeted field research, and then at the end we'll talk about one of our extension initiatives that we are in the process uh, of developing. So I can't tell if tonight's crowd is, is truly interested in, in this topic or just will do anything to get out of watching uh, the debate <laughs> at 8 o'clock tonight. So, a uh, <laughs> Speaking of debate, though, this topic, pesticide usage in lawns, is oftentimes a, a controversial topic. And certainly, uh, it's very emotional uh, to different people. And, um, and what we try and do in, in my program is, is take the emotion out of it as much as we can and focus, focus on the science and uh, focus on the data. So uh, with that, I know I've already had conversations with people in the room who just flat out don't like turf grass. That's fine. I don't have any, I don't have any personal connection to turf. But turf grass landscapes are, uh, do make up some of our iconic places, both here on the UW campus, obviously Bascom Hill, centerpiece of, uh, of the college game day show, centerpiece of campus. When people, when alumni uh, leave this campus and they come back 20, 25 years later, they probably think of two places. One is the terrace, and two is probably Bascom Hill. Okay, so this is an iconic spot on campus. And you can go to hundreds of uh, college campuses around the country, around the world. You can go to cities all around the world, those urban centers uh, where turf grass plots and urban landscapes, I don't want to just focus on turf grass, we'll focus mostly on turf tonight, but urban landscapes in general, so turf, trees, flowers, all that is important for, uh, for, for well-being. Um, obviously they play an aesthetic role, but there's reams of studies that show increased mental well-being, decreased crime, increased oxygen production, decreased noise, uh, increased cooling as it relates to uh, parks, especially as we get into urban centers. So we're going to go throughout most of this talk assuming that uh, attractive and functional turf grass landscapes are an important part of, uh, of urban centers. I know everybody doesn't quite um, uh, agree with that 100%, but that's the, the, uh, the beginning point that we're going to make in the talk tonight. What do I mean by functional? Functional means that um, they need to be used for something. Right? So I fully support in, in certain environments, uh, putting in natural systems, prairie plants, uh, other plants like that. But for, for our purposes here tonight, we're, we're looking at something that, that can be used by uh, the general public. So obviously, uh, we have a lot of these sites uh, around campus. Uh, in Wisconsin, Wisconsin has a, uh, has a booming golf business as well. And obviously, that makes up, uh, those are made up of, of turf grass as well. So this is a picture of Aaron Hills, which next year is going to host the United States Open Golf Championship, which is a huge, one of the biggest golf tournaments in the world. Uh, it will be an economic engine. You're going to be hearing 
so much about it in the next year that you're going to be really sick of it by next June. Um, and of course, we also have sites like this. Some of the most iconic uh, sports sites in the world are made up of turf grass here in Wisconsin. Unfortunately, uh, the team isn't living up to the billing as much as, as the iconic frozen tundra uh, here at Lambeau Field uh, also uh, represents some of those turf grass landscapes and urban landscapes here in, in the state. And it's not just the huge iconic ones, right? It's also the sports fields that, uh, that our kids and our grandkids play soccer on, that our pets run around on, and that sort of thing. I think for, the most, for most of us, though, uh, it's not those city parks, it's not the golf courses, and it's not Lambeau Field or Miller Park or whatever that really are the, the, uh, the sweet spots related to uh, turf grass. Really, it's, it's, it's these sorts of pictures. So I make two priorities whenever I give a talk, right? I try and, and provide accurate information to our clientele, and I try and get my dog in every single talk that I give. <laughs> so here's Steve uh, hanging, out in, uh, hanging out in the backyard. And I think this is what most people value their landscapes for the most, is having uh, you know, an attractive, a functional uh, place where they can hang out with, with their family. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, we moved into our new house uh, just a couple blocks west of Madison, West High, uh, last summer. And one of the reasons we bought the house is we loved, we loved the backyard. And, uh, and obviously, as you can tell here, Steve loves the backyard as well. So even though these are important places to us, they do carry some causes for concern related to uh, inputs. So I know this doesn't play well on Wisconsin Public Television, but we're going to play a little bit of a game here real quick, right? Everybody knows the association game, right? So I w I'm going to have a word come up here very shortly. And I want you to all respond with the first thing that pops back in your head, okay? Just feel free to go ahead and yell it out. Everybody ready? Everybody ready? All right, so here it comes. Bad. Bad. I think I heard poison in there. All right, so when I give a talk to the general public, and I've given something related to this talk to a lot of general public groups around the state of Wisconsin, that's typically the first thing that pops out, right? Some sort of toxin or poison, uh, something that is very bad and very harmful. But if I give this talk or some uh, relation of this talk to uh, some sort of industry group, right, usually the first thing that pops <coughs> into their head is some sort of protection, right? So protection from disease, protection from a weed pest, protection from an insect pest. A lot of these pesticides are important for how they do their job, whether it's producing food or, in my case, whether it's producing these attractive functional landscapes that, uh, that many people um, demand. With relation to pesticides, I think for the most part, most of our modern pesticides do not have a high acute toxicity. When I talk about acute toxicity, if you have a single exposure to them, you're not going to be significantly injured, right? A lot of those older pesticides, we'll talk some about some of those older pesticides that were very harmful. You'd have one exposure and you'd have significant uh, neurodevelopmental damage or pass out or start vomiting. Most of those have been taken off the market. So I think the largest concern with the pesticides on the market today, as far as fear from the general public, is related to more chronic exposures, things like uh, cancer development or things like uh, neurodegenerative disorders, that, that sort of thing. And so one of the tests that the EPA has put into place to try and get at some of that is related to endocrine disruption. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about the dose making the poison in, in a few slides, but endocrine disruption uh, is basically hormone disruption. Okay, so the endocrine system is, is analogous to the hormone system. And very small perturbations in this endocrine system can, re can uh, result in very large uh, injury to the body, both in the short term and uh, especially in the long term. This is especially true in, in developing organisms. So typically children have uh, uh, an outsized impact when their, when their endocrine system is uh, perturbed. And, and this endocrine disruption was uh, brought to wide publicity following uh, the release of the book Our Stolen Future in 1996. Our Stolen Future did for endocrine disruption really what Silent Spring did for more general environmental chemicals back in, uh, back in the 60s. So we'll, we'll just kind of focus on endocrine disruption here for, a, for a, a, a few more minutes. So the Food Quality Protection Act was passed in 1996, unanimous, unanimously by the Senate, if you can believe, believe that. 100 to nothing. The Food Quality Protection Act was passed in 1996 was the largest shuffling of how pesticides regulated in the United States since the 1970s. One aspect of that Food Quality Protection Act was that it mandated uh, all pesticides be tested for endocrine disruption. Okay, so that was in 1996. 
the testing has just been getting going in the past couple years, right? So it really took you know, almost 20 years of work by toxicologists and endocrine specialists to develop the sort of testing that would be uh, both practical and that they could test chemicals at a, at a somewhat reasonable rate and also impactful, that they could, uh, they could make a difference by uh, the results uh, of these tests. So um, the, uh, they, they listed in 2007 or 8, I believe, an initial list of chemicals, 52 chemicals. Now these are not all pesticides. There are a lot of other environmental chemicals that are on this list. And um, in just in, in uh, June of 2015, they released the tier one results for those, that initial list of chemicals. And what do I mean by tier one results? So there's so many chemicals out there that they want to test. They want to do some sort of prioritization. Okay, so the tier one test is a series of relatively cheap, relatively cheap and relatively quick tests that they are conducting to see which are the ones that have the highest likelihood of impacting the endocrine system. Okay. They use a weight of evidence approach. What I mean by a weight of evidence approach is they have several different assays that they run on each chemical. These, these assays have particular redundancies. Okay? So there's not just one assay they run for the endocrine system. They have, for tier one, they have 11 different assays they run. And multiple tests test for disruption to the estrogen system, uh, or estrogen pathway, excuse me. Multiple tests for disruption to the androgen pathway and the thyroid pathway. Okay? So they're trying to uh, not just use one test for each one because uh, those of us in, in any biological system know that uh, you can oftentimes get conflicting results. Right? So if you have just one test, one chemical might test positive for it, another chemical might, or that same chemical might test positive on a related test. So they want to have all these different sorts of, of assays providing feedback and then um, using that feedback to try and give a, uh, a, a high confidence result in if these chemicals then should, get, should, should then go on to do tier two testing. And then tier two testing is the more stringent, more expensive, more uh, involved testing that will get uh, even deeper into whether some of these chemicals uh, truly do have endocrine disruption. The full uh, results of all 52 chemicals, chemicals can be found on the EPA's website. So I'm not gonna expect everybody to remember that, uh, that website, but if you just you know, Google uh, EDSP, which is the abbreviation for Endocrine, Endocrine Disruptor Screening Program and, and uh, and tier one results, it should be one of the top hits that come up. And there's a big, long uh, sheet of pages for each one of these uh, chemicals on that website, and they can give you the full results. And there's, you know, of course, they provide a nice little summary page that so you don't have to read all 65 pages for each individual chemical. You can just read the summary page that gives uh, gives some of those results. So I do want to touch on that weight of evidence approach again before we move into some of uh, just a couple of the results. So this is the list, the full list of the tier one assay results that the EPA conducts for their EDSP, the tier one EDSP. All right, some of them are very simple. This ER binding assay, all that is is do does a pesticide or does another environmental chemical bind with uh, an estrogen receptor? Okay, so uh, they're testing for both agonism and antagonism. So an agonist would be a chemical that would bind and increase the rate of production of estrogen from this estrogen receptor. All right, an antagonist would do just the opposite. So they want to test for both. But this ER binding assay very simply just tests for whether the chemicals bind to the receptor. Okay, same thing for the AR binding assay. That's uh, the androgen receptor, right, related to testosterone production. Okay, so then we have another, then we have all these series of assays further down. They're a little more, they're a little more what I would call endpoint based. Okay, so I'll focus for just a minute here on the, the, the Hirschberger assay right here. So what that is, that is an assay that is related to the androgen receptor. It's related to the androgen pathway. And it's not just simple, a simple receptor-based assay. What it is, though, is it's an, an endpoint end assay. So they will uh, administer uh, whatever chemical they're trying to test, uh, typically to uh, rats. And then after a certain period of time, they would harvest and weigh uh, some of the uh, the organs that are related to uh, the androgen receptor. These are typically referred to as accessory sex organs. These can be things like the ventral prostate, seminal vesicles, similar organs to that. And if they see significant changes in weight, up or down, uh, related to their uh, non-treated controls, uh, then they might, uh, th that might indicate that that particular chemical is a disruptor of that particular endocrine system. Okay? So they do all these tests. Uh, some of them are yeses, some of them are noes, some of them um, 
give conflicting results, and then they take the results from all those 11 assays together and they make their final recommendation. Okay? So for some of our important uh, or widely used <coughs> chemicals in the, uh, in the urban landscape market, one of the most important ones is 2,4-D, widely applied as a selective herbicide. Right? This is the herbicide that gets rid of the dandelions in the yard but doesn't kill the grass. The results from their tier one testing is that there's no convincing evidence of interaction with the androgen, the estrogen, or the thyroid system. They recommended no further testing as far as endocrine disruption. This does not mean that 2,4-D does not have any uh, toxic properties or that it's a completely safe uh, product. It is not. As far as endocrine disruption is concerned, though, this particular chemical uh, does not have any concern from EPA's point of view. Glyphosate, right? Roundup. Huge product, been in the news a lot lately after IARC's uh, characterization as a probable uh, cancer car uh, probably causes cancer. They're, they're group 2A classification. Uh, again, though, from an endocrine disruptor standpoint, no convincing evidence of interaction with androgen, estrogen, or thyroid systems. Did not recommend further testing with tier 2. All right, what about imidacloprid? This is a neonicotinoid insecticide, right? Getting a lot of press uh, along with the other neonicotinoid insecticides because of pollinator disruption or pollinator um, mortality and pollinator toxicity. For, from an endocrine disruptor standpoint, though, again, there's no convincing convincing evidence of interaction with and androgen, estrogen, or the thyroid system did not recommend uh, further tier two testing. All right, so you might think, well, these assays just don't work, okay? They're saying everything's fine. Well, that's not the case. If we go to another insecticide, Carboryl, the brand name Seven, uh, this is one that did have uh, some interaction, but it's, it's, it's not you know, as widespread as we might think. No convincing evidence with estrogen or thyroid pathways in mammals or wildlife. Uh, but there is evidence that there's potential interaction with the androgen pathway in fish. All right? So there, there's, there's some, some clear evidence that this particular chemical does have some interaction with the, the endocrine system, especially in fish. This will be, they, they do recommend further tier 2 testing with this particular chemical. Okay? So it's on a chemical by chemical basis. This tier 1 testing, if it, if, it, if it doesn't have any interaction or has very low interaction going to this tier 1 testing, it does not go on to further testing. Uh, in some cases, they did have interaction with tier two testing, and now they're going on further. There's another list of chemicals that they are in the process of testing. I haven't seen that the results from that second list of chemicals was, uh, was released yet. Um, so you might think then that, you know, I think that pesticides are totally fine. This is going to be a pro-pesticide talk, and that's, that's not what it is. I don't think pesticides are fine. I don't think pesticides are horrible. I think each pesticide should be judged individually. And so there's, in, in my opinion, as I've talked with more and more people about pesticides, there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect. So uh, I was at, I go to the Society of Toxicology annual meeting every year. And a couple years ago, they had, a, they had a symposium. The symposium was titled, Impact of Pesticides on Neurodegenerative Disorders. All right, so you know, I, I, do, I do a lot of pesticide work. This sounds like a highly interesting symposium. So I go to this symposium. It was a half-day symposium. There was three or four research presenting, uh, researchers presenting extremely uh, compelling evidence that uh, pestis, this pesticide uh, did uh, cause significant neurodegenerative um, complications. But the entire four-hour symposium was on one, one pesticide. All right? And that one pesticide was DDT. Now, DDT is, is, is an important pesticide, but it was banned in, in 1972, I think, 1972 or 1976. Uh, now, this chemical can last in the environment for a very prolonged period of time, but it has not been used in the United States since, since the 1970s. So the general public, though, would not, or if, if there was a journalist at this symposium that was going to write up a, 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 an article for the, for the newspaper on this symposium, they certainly wouldn't title it DDT causes neurodegenerative disorders, they would title it pesticides cause neurodegenerative disorders. And so I think that's a little bit unfair because DDT has been around since the 1940s, product of World War II uh, research, okay? And we know that it has horrible environmental consequences and we know that it also has uh, significant uh, human and, mam and mammalian toxicity as well. So I think the disconnect is people see any pesticide today Let's take, a, for example, heritage. Heritage is a fungicide that is typically sprayed a few times on a golf course in a given year. It's also used um, in fruits and, and, and vegetable production as well. The active ingredient is azoxystrobin. This is a chemical that is, um, what is an analog of a natural compound that's produced by mushrooms in the environment to basically fend off other mushrooms. It's a natural-based fungicide. It has been labeled as reduced risk by the Environmental Protection Agency. But when people 
uh, see that heritage is a fungicide, meaning that it's a pesticide. You know, the, the initial inkling, the first, the kind of the gut response is that it's no different than DDT. Right? It's, as high, it's as toxic as DDT. It's going to cause all the same problems that DDT caused. And in my opinion, this is, um, this is as, as misguided as saying that a, you know, a 1956 Buick Skylark is going to produce the same amount of air pollution as a 2015 Toyota Prius. Okay, we have older pesticides that, are, that do have significant environmental and, and, and human uh, toxicity problems, but we also have newer pesticides that, that don't have a lot of the same problems. Now, I'm not saying heritage can be sprayed everywhere and has absolutely no problems at all. It doesn't. It does have some, some environmental concerns, but to group modern pesticides that go through some of the modern uh, testing regimes with the ones that have been around for a long time, I think doesn't make toxicological sense, and I think uh, leads to some of these uh, some of these large scale bans that we're seeing over continents, over countries, and increasingly coming in uh, to the United States. So uh, Canada, for the most part, has banned synthetic pesticides on amenity turf grasses, so mostly lawns. They have not banned them for the most part on golf courses, though they are restricting uh, pesticides, um, at least fungicides, for the use uh, their use on golf courses. Uh, Connecticut is, uh, is a state that has banned uh, synthetic pesticide usage on uh, any public school grounds, so public school playing fields. And uh, the most recent uh, large uh, or a high profile one was uh, Montgomery County outside of Washington, D.C. <coughs> banning all synthetic pesticide usage on uh, lawns in uh, Montgomery County. Again, my point here is not that all pesticides are good or that all pesticides are bad, uh, that there are some pesticides that are less harmful than others. And we want to make sure that we're focusing on using some of those lower impact pesticides as opposed to the older ones. So I don't, I don't, propone, I don't uh, promote the wide scale ban of all of them. If you talk to uh, people in Canada where this ban has been in place for a few years, they're having difficulty maintaining the, the level of landscapes that people have come to expect up in Canada. I haven't heard any word from Connecticut or from uh, New York State, which is another one that has uh, a lot of uh, pesticide bans in place on those landscapes because those bans have just gone in, in, into effect in the past uh, year or two. So we'll, we'll see what the impact is uh, moving forward. So this all comes back then to this sort of dilemma of the modern American law. All right, so if we, you know, if we look at some stats, 83% of Americans felt having a lawn is important. It's tough to get 83% of Americans to agree on anything. Uh, this, this Harris poll in 2015. Same poll, 71% of Americans felt that maintaining a lawn helps maintain a community standard. I know I talk with people almost every day that, that do not agree with this as, as far as it relates to a turf grass lawn. Uh, but there are a large majority of people in the country that do feel this. Paul Robbins is the head of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies here at the University of Wisconsin. He wrote an excellent book uh, called Lawn People. I don't agree with everything that he wrote in the book, but I do agree with a lot of what he wrote in the book. And one of the points from his book is that the majority of survey respondents felt neighbors' lawn care practices had a positive impact on neighborhood pride, right? So um, a lot of that actually, you know, when you, when you delve into it, a lot of that comes back to uh, property values. But it is a point of this sort of this sense of community that we want we want our neighborhood to, to, to be this sense of place, and the lawn comes into that, just like other parts of a house do, right? I don't, I don't see the lawn as, as necessarily anything terribly different than keeping the house painted, or if the window breaks, making sure that window is fixed, okay? I think the lawn plays into the overall aspect of, of, of how, the, how the home relates to the rest of, of that community. A couple more points from uh, Paul Robbins' book then. Um, the different survey that he did in the book uh, you noted that people have significant anxieties about lawn chemicals, but it does little to change their behavior as it relates to chemical use. I like that term, anxiety, because I, I, I pick that up when I talk to people as well. People want their lawn to look nice. Okay? Most people want their lawn to look nice. That does not mean that they want e most people don't want every single possible weed taken out of that, uh, taken out of that lawn, but they want that lawn to look nice. And it's, it's very difficult in, in many cases to do so through organic or no pesticide uh, practices. The easiest and the cheapest way to do it is to typically apply uh, some sort of synthetic pesticide. And so um, they realize that these pesticides can have some, some significant uh, environmental and, and, and human health or pet harm if applied improperly, but they still want their lawn to look nice. So this anxiety here. And they give three reasons, in, or Paul gives three reasons in the book about why it does not change their behavior. One, they have trust in professional applicators. In many cases, this trust is valid. 
and most of our professional turf grass applicators are highly, uh, highly um, effective and are, are good at what they do. We do have, as in any profession, we do have some bad apples that are not, they don't really know what they're doing, to be perfectly honest, and, and they, they misapply some of these products. And I think it's important that moving forward, we have uh, some way to make sure that those who are applying chemicals improperly are, are corrected in what they're doing. Two, obviously, we have hectic lives. Right? There's not a lot of time to go out there and spend time pulling weeds or going and spraying stuff ourselves. You know, Tom was talking about rushing around, picking up his kids from hockey practice today. And I mean, everybody has a different uh, aspect to their life that is highly hectic. And if they can kind of put the lawn care away and have somebody else do it, that helps uh, free up time for other things. And again, that third point comes back to maintaining this neighborhood norm, right? Maintaining this, this sense of place that a lot of people feel that their lawn uh, is an important part of in, in maintaining this community. All right, so this, this to, in my mind, when I, after I read Paul's book, I thought this was, this offered up an opportunity. Okay, the opportunity was, we, we start with people want to have high quality lawns. Not perfect lawns, but most people want to have high quality lawns. That's important to people. But they also want, um, there's a desire to do so with a lower environmental impact. Okay, so that's, in my mind, that's where the opportunity is. So the title of the talk today then was, how do we set up reduced risk strategies for pest, man pest management in urban lawns? And if we're gonna talk about reducing risk, we first have to define what risk is. And so risk is a toxicological equation. It's the foundational principle of toxicology. I think many people have, have, have heard of the, the risk equation, and risk is equal to hazard times exposure. So hazard would be analogous to toxicity. So the more toxic a compound is, the higher the risk for injury is. Uh, the more exposure to a particular uh, chemical, the higher the risk for injury is. This comes back again to where toxicology was founded. And the father of toxicology is uh, Paracelsus. He, uh, I think he, he lived in the, the 1500s, and he came up with the statement, poison is in everything and no thing was, that was without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. If we Twitterify that, we come down with the dose makes the poison. Okay, so this is a very uh, well-known phrase. And so if we want to reduce risk then, we have to do one of two things if we're going to use that equation. One, we have to reduce exposure. Okay, so these guys are doing a poor job of reducing exposure. This is, this is a picture of, uh, from I believe the 1920s, a Bordeaux mixture being sprayed on a golf course. Okay, very poor uh, uh, job at minimizing exposure. We can minimize exposure, in my mind, in two ways. We can spray only when we, to, only when we need to and only where we need to. Okay, so those are the two uh, easiest ways to reduce uh, exposure or not spray at all. Then the other, the other part of that equation is the hazard part of that equation. We want to spray uh, compounds that have a lower toxicity or a lower impact. So how do we go about doing both of those things? So very briefly, how do we go about reducing exposure? Again, we want to spray only when we need to and only where we need to. This comes down to what we generally call integrated pest management, or IPM. Right? This is a concept that has been around uh, for several decades. It comes, you know, gets a different name every now and then. But basically, it's managing the plants the right way, making the plants as healthy as possible so they are better able to fend off pests and we don't need to spray pesticides uh, often. Okay, so this lawn right here it's not had pesticides applied. It is a very healthy, dense lawn. This lawn is not going to have any weeds. There's nowhere for a weed to come in. Very unlikely that this lawn, if properly managed, will have any, many insect problems. Also very unlikely that this lawn is going to have a lot of disease problems as well. Okay? So if we manage the lawn the right way, and if we manage our plants in general, if you're talking about potatoes, if you're talking about cranberries, apples, manage those plants the right way, you can significantly reduce the amount of pesticides uh, that are applied. Of course, though, when we're talking about lawn care management, it's really impossible for us to go around and talk to every single homeowner around the country and, and make sure that they're managing uh, their lawn the right way. So that's why uh, pesticides, again, are usually the most effective and the most efficient and the cheapest way to manage some of these uh, pests that come in. The other important thing to do is, is to know the biology of the pests that you're managing, okay? So if you are managing a particular insect pest, let's say a white grub, you need to know the biology of that insect pest. So you apply, if you are gonna use an insecticide, uh, and pesticides are a part of integrated pest management, IPM. If you are gonna use an insecticide, you apply that insecticide at the proper time so it does, uh, it does its job. The worst possible thing you can do when, when using a pesticide is to not know what you're doing with that pesticide, apply it at the wrong time so that you put a pesticide into the environment and you haven't done anything to control the pest. 
Okay, so that's really the worst possible thing that we can get out of this. And then we want to make sure that we're not having uh, residues rub off of the lawn onto uh, people that are enjoying uh, the lawn. And that's why these signs are up. These signs are up. These landscape uh, signs are up to try and keep people off of that lawn until uh, the pesticide one has dried on the leaf and after a period of time will become what we call dislodgeable. Okay, so typically over a period of time the pesticide absorbs more and more into the, into the leaf cell, it's into the leaf blade itself. And even if you roll around at it all you want, you're just not going to get that pesticide off there. That's what we call a dislodgeable residue. So within 24 hours, a lot of that pesticide is dislodgeable. Within 72 hours, the vast, vast, vast majority of that pesticide is dislodgeable. On, on home lawn landscapes, uh, this sign needs to be kept up till sunset the following day. So that is typically almost always at least 24 hours. On school grounds, that, that uh, pesticide sign needs to be kept up for 72 hours. All right, so if we, if, we, if we sort of implement as many of those practices as we can to limit our exposure as much as we can, uh, that, that, that uh, addresses the exposure part of the risk equation, but we also want to address the hazard uh, part of the equation. This is actually a tougher thing to measure, a much tougher thing to measure. One way we can do it is we can go by the actual amount of active ingredient that we're putting out <coughs> in the environment. So we have two insecticides here. One is merit. The active ingredient is imidacloprid. It is a neonicotinoid insecticide. The other one we have here is, uh, is a celeprin. That's another insecticide. A celeprin that came out in the last few years. Merit came out, ooh, I believe in the 80s or the 90s. Merit is not a particularly uh, acutely toxic product to mammals. It has a uh, high bee toxicity, but not a, a, a particularly acute um, mammalian toxicity rating. But it does have a much higher level of active ingredient that we're putting in the environment in a typical application than compared to a celebrant, right? So merit, uh, the merit uh, formulation contains 75% active ingredient, whereas the celebrant contains about 18%. Okay, so we can't just uh, measure a compound's hazard by the amount of active ingredient because getting back to that risk equation is both the hazard and the exposure. So even if you put out a very small amount of the product into the environment, there still can be some hazardous uh, component of that, that product. And that's where we get into some of these other models. Okay, so pesticide toxicity is very complex as we take into account leaching, impact on fish, impact on birds, all this sort of different things. And uh, it's difficult to you know, sort of calculate exactly where the, the toxicity is, right? So a certain compound might be toxic to fish, but not to mammals. Another compound might be uh, a significant leacher into groundwater. Another one might uh, might reside up in the fat. So it's difficult uh, to really give kind of one, one uh, description of toxicity of a compound. There's some of these models that try and uh, incorporate uh, several different factors of, of toxicity into uh, sort of one number. IPM prime out of Oregon State is uh, one. It's site specific, so it's not really going to be of use to, uh, to us in some of our work. The pesticide load index is what the European Union uses to calculate the tax on pesticides, especially in Denmark. The environmental impact quotient is one that was developed out of Cor uh, Cornell University that tries to sort of take, account every, take into account everything. And then the hazard quotient uh, was developed by some weed scientists. And this focuses specifically on acute mammalian toxicity. And so we have worked mostly with the environmental impact quotient, uh, which is EIQ, uh, short for that, and then hazard quotient, which we abbreviate as, uh, as HQ. All right, so whatever we do with any model that we use, there's always some level of, of criticism, right? And so we were trying to find models that w would be effective for us, and we're still always looking at new models that might provide some, some benefit to our operations. And I kind of chuckled when I came across this tweet from uh, Jessica Rodkowski. She's a, a plant breeder uh, from Cornell University. She put this out last spring, models. And I especially like the, the bottom quote, remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? Okay, so, so keep this in mind as we try to use these models. Every model that we've, we've been looking at has some sort of, of drawback. But I do think they do provide uh, use in trying to assess the level of, of toxicity of some of these compounds. All right, so I told you before that we, uh, we've just been going uh, for a couple of years. We're, we're just starting to gather some preliminary data into some of our our deeper in-depth research, and I'll, talk, I'll just touch on what some of that research is in a minute. But we have, uh, we have gone about uh, conducting some very quick applied uh, research using some of these products that we have labeled as lower risk, lower toxicity products. And if we're going to control pests in the lawn, we have three that we're going to focus on. 
right? Three weeds, creeping charley, dandelion, and crabgrass, right? Those are the three weeds that the majority of, of people would like to see, at least see suppressed in the lawn. And then we have one primary insect pest, uh, white grubs, that uh, can cause some significant damage as well. If we can suppress these four pests, we're gonna, do, uh, we're gonna go a long way towards uh, providing high quality landscapes for, um, for the public. All right, so we did do uh, what we called our reduced toxicity herbicide trials. So we looked at, looked at several different uh, herbicides and herbicide mixtures uh, and try to assess how effective they would be uh, out in, in the landscape. And so it's, it's a pretty small study. Uh, we started this in the fall of 2015. Fiesta is an iron chelate product. It's really the only pesticide that's available for, available for, for landscape use in Canada. Tenacity is a reduced, re, reduced risk herbicide from uh, Syngenta. Quicksilver is uh, another compound that has very low AI usage. Adios is actually just uh, sodium chloride, it's just salt. Uh, at 20% or less, it is an OMRI certified uh, herbicide. Defender is another low impact uh, product that we've been uh, testing. Turflon ester is a product that's been around for a, a while, but is one that does have a comparatively relatively low uh, impact. And then sort of the positive control in the study is the three-way mix, Trimec 1000, which contains a mixture of 2,4-D, dicamba, and MCPP. And if we go over here and look in the right two columns, if we focus on the hazard quotient, we see that with some of these products, sort of the more natural compounds, the sodium chloride and the iron chelate, this HQ, this hazard quotient rate, is actually quite high. And the reason it's quite high is because the hazard quotient takes into account uh, rate of application. And both of these have very high rates of application. They also have some decently high acute toxicities. Uh, but if we look at some of these other products, these are synthetic products, and they're not OMRI certified, but these are synthetic pro products. They have both a low uh, hazard quotient and also a low EIQ, right? Especially when we compare it to uh, this three-way mixture. All right, so how then have these performed? We're still you know, collecting all the results and, and analyzing uh, the results. Uh, but just a real quick uh, show of, of a, a visual show of how some of these products perform. On the left, we have the non-treated control, which is filled with dandelion and clover and creeping charlie and all sorts of weeds. And then we have our positive control, the one we'd expect to do quite well, that three-way mixture of three different herbicides. But if we go and we look at some of these other lower impact pesticides, some of them worked and some of them didn't. Here's Fiesta, that iron chelate. Right? This one did not work terribly well. And if we talk to our counterparts in Canada, this product is not very effective at uh, suppressing weed pests in lawns in, uh, in Canada. And we see the same results uh, here in our trial. Right? If we look at Turflon ester, or, uh, Turflon ester this is another uh, lower impact uh, chemical. And this one is performing well. Again, we're not getting complete 100% control of all weeds. We are suppressing weeds to the point where we still have a, a decent landscape that uh, will be suitable for most people's, uh, most people's situations, certainly compared to this, where eventually over time, this one will continue to uh, uh, thin out and eventually will probably down to uh, some very thin creeping weeds and, and probably quite a bit of soil involved in that, in that as well. Defender is one of the products that has worked very well in our trials and other trials as well. Again, this is working uh, quite well, almost as well as that three-way mixture and the environmental impact of that, of that chemical is, is significantly lower. So there are some, uh, some options here. I'm not the only one that's done this research. My, research. my colleague here at the University of Wisconsin in soil science, Doug Solda, has worked with the same product, Defender, uh, with specific uh, action on dandelion. And uh, as you can see, the product is effective. Okay? It's a low impact product, it's still effective. Okay? So this, for those that that want to want to suppress some of the, the major weed pests uh, on their lawn in Wisconsin, not eliminate every single one, but suppress them. This is a potential option uh, for uh, for doing so. All right, if we look at grub control, then really our major insect pests, we have two. You know, I've kind of presented a case by case, a side by side comparison. We have Merit, that imidacloprid product, and then we have a Celeprin, which is the uh, chloranthrinolipole, uh, is the active ingredient of that product. Okay, so the pros of Merit, you have flexible application timing. It's a highly effective product against grubs. Uh, Acelepren, also highly effective. It's also effective on other insect pests as well, even though white grubs are gonna be certainly our most significant pests. Uh, that EIQ rating that we talked about before, Acelepren is a much lower uh, impact product. It's also a, very, a, a much, much lower acutely toxic uh, product. 
Perhaps one of the uh, most beneficial aspects of the sacelopril is that it is not labeled as highly toxic to bees, whereas imidacloprid, a neonicotinoid insecticide, has been labeled as highly toxic to, uh, to bees. I talked to an entomologist just today, and, and he said the only way that you're going to kill a bee with a celeprin is if you take the jug and you hit the bee over the head with it. Okay? <laughs> it, is a, it is a relatively, uh, essentially non-toxic uh, chemical as it as comes into contact with, uh, with bees. The downfall of this product, it's expensive. And that's what we see. A lot, of these, a lot of these lower impact products are more expensive. They're newer products and uh, it's, it's a trade-off, right? If you want to pay that premium to have the lower impact, uh, the lower impact pest control. All right, so what are we doing about it in, in my lab? This, this sort of how do we produce quality landscapes and at the same time reduce the environmental impact of those products used? So here's, here's my motley crew of uh, my lab. Uh, we did get a little bit done at this lab meeting, I guarantee you, despite it being on the terrace. We did get, uh, you know, we took five minutes of work and then we moved on uh, to other things. And some of the things that we're focusing on that, you know, maybe Tom will invite me back in a few years and we'll talk about some of the results and have some really nitty gritty data up there and we can all debate the graphs and all that sort of stuff. I don't have the results for this now because we're just starting to collect preliminary, da preliminary, preliminary data that we'll then use to, to generate some larger grants. One of those studies is looking at the fate of applied pesticides in varying environments. This is mostly uh, pesticides applied to golf courses and how they react during the winter. Uh, so that's one area that we're focusing on. The impact of various lawn pesticides on the soil microbiome. You know that microbiome is sort of a hot area in biology and medicine in general. And so we're getting into that with uh, what impact these various lawn pesticides have on the soil microbiome. Do they have a negative impact on some of our beneficial microorganisms? And if so, how can we mitigate that impact and so we, we protect the beneficial organisms in the soil? Another area that we're working on is then kind of a, almost the, the opposite side of that same coin, the impact of soil microbial activity on pesticide metabolic production. So if we change the microbiome by putting down a pesticide, how does that changed microbiome then uh, feed back and break down the pesticide? Do we still get the same metabolites? Do we get different metabolites? Or if we do get different metabolites, are they more or less toxic than what we were seeing originally? So those are some areas that we're just starting to get into, um, and I think they'll be fun, uh, fun pieces to talk about in a few years. As I mentioned earlier, I do have an extension component as well, and as part of my extension uh, program, we are uh, in the process of developing a, a new initiative, and we're calling this initiative the Common Ground Initiative. So just a, a couple pieces about what this initiative is. It is still in the developmental phases, but what we're looking to do is gonna, we're, we're looking to calculate the average level of pesticide usage on Wisconsin turf grass. And when I say average level of pesticide usage, we're gonna calculate the average level of pesticide usage and the level of environmental impact with some metric, whether it's EIQ, whether it's hazard quotient, whether it's something else. We haven't come up and determined that yet. Uh, we'll split up golf, athletic turf, and home lawn because they're very, very different aspects of the turf grass industry. And again, we're going to go ahead and calculate that total active ingredient and environmental impact. Then what we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're going to use science-based research to create a target, a target parameter in both active ingredient and environmental impact re relative to that statewide average. Okay, so when I talk about science-based research, I'm talking about some of the direct trials that I just showed you, research that we've done at Wisconsin, research that we've done, uh, that, other, that other places have done that showed that some of these products, these lower impact products, can provide uh, effective landscapes. We don't want to make sure that we're only promoting products that are not going to perform well out in, out in, the, in, the, in the real world. That doesn't, that doesn't do them, us, or you any good. So we want to make sure that we're still producing uh, quality landscapes. Then after we have that target parameter set, we will invite turf grass managers to participate in our initiative. So this will be people like golf course superintendents, this will be people like uh, lawn care operators, uh, potentially uh, public city park managers as well if, if municipalities are interested in joining up as well. And uh, we'll help them promote their efforts. Okay? So the, the more specific goals of the initiative are to provide incentive to use some of these reduced toxicity products. Right now, products are selected on the basis of two factors, price and efficacy. So how much does it cost and does it work? We want to add in sort of a market-based incentive <coughs> to uh, take into account uh, toxic toxicity and impact of that product as well. We also want to help the industry market and document their reduction efforts. Okay, so if every company does this on their own, I feel that's less impactful if the, the industry as a whole is, is banding together to show, uh, to show their efforts. 
We also want to help the public find turf managers that are using reduced toxicity programs. So if you want to hire a lawn care service and it is important to you to have a lawn care service that uses reduced toxicity products, what we would plan to do then is those turf grass managers that are participating in our initiative and that have a program that meets our target parameters, we would publicize their efforts on the website. So all you have to do rather than call individual lawn care companies is you would go to the website. You'd see, you know what, this particular company is participating in this initiative. This is the name of their program that meets their target parameters. I'm going to call them up and, call them up and ask about that particular program. And then we also want to keep the public well informed so they aren't swayed by misinformation. We are not going to post a whole lot of new information on pesticide toxicity and research and all that. There's a lot of great resources online. We want to make sure that we are pointing people to the, to the right ones, the ones that include science-based uh, information and results. So we are working with a group uh, called Sustainable Stoughton down in uh, Stoughton, as you might guess. At, uh, and they have a park down there called Racetrack Park. Anybody familiar with Racetrack Park? In, in Stoughton, and uh, they're a group that contacted us. They were worried about pesticide usage in uh, their community, and they wanted to see some sort of change. So they actually went to, they contacted their city park uh, manager first, and the city park manager come, came and contacted us because he knew we were working in some of this reduced toxicity work. <coughs> and so at Racetrack Park, they have this complex of four softball slash baseball fields. So we talked to Sustainable Stoughton, and we talked to the Stoughton uh, Park Department about letting us use this park as sort of a demonstration. Okay, so we kind of numbered these four fields and we managed them in four completely different ways. All right, so we have one that we agreed that we would manage as uh, an organic field. Okay, so we only used organic fertilizer. We used a chicken manure fertilizer, Chick Magic, and we used this Fiesta herbicide, this, this iron chelate uh, herbicide, which is, which is OMRI certified as, as organic. We also have field number two, which we consider our IPM plan, which is sort of our recommendation for how we would recommend uh, Stoughton manage, manage their parks and manage these fields. Use a slow release natural fertilizer and then one of these lower impact products, Confront, which is the same product as that turf lot ester that we showed in that one trial. Then uh, plot, uh, field number three was what the uh, city of Stoughton currently does, which is uh, fast release synthetic fertilizers and that three-way mixture of herbicide. This one is called True Power 3. There's a lot of different types of that three-way mixture. And then field four was done. Don't do anything, just mow it. All right, so uh, we're just finishing up the second year of this study. We're just starting to get more and more results in. Again, I don't, I don't have graphs or pictures to show you. I will say there are some significant differences developing between this plot. I will just tell you that the organic plot does look pretty good, but we also need to take in cost of management into account when we're talking about public facilities. And uh, the cost is uh, prohibitive for that, for that organic management, uh, according to the city of Stoughton. Uh, the IPM plan and their current plan, uh, for the most part, are fairly similar. We do, have, we do see some more weeds in the IPM plan than, than what the current plan is, but again, it's a trade-off. What, what, what do the, the Stoughton city <coughs> residents want? Do they want absolutely no weeds? Do they want uh, the highest quality? Are they willing to give uh, a trade-off a little bit by using some of these other products? And that's not something that we are trying to sway people either way. Our job, in my opinion, is to provide individual, individuals, families, municipalities, lawn care managers, golf course superintendents with, with, the, with, the, with the conditions they want and try and get them to that point using the least impactful products uh, that are possible. So more information will be coming out uh, on this demonstration and this initiative in, in the next couple of years. All right, so uh, just a couple of summary points here. I feel that reducing the toxicity of the compounds that we currently use is important for reducing non-target impacts. So if you are somebody who is concerned about that, if you're anxious about that chemical usage and you want to go a different path, uh, then uh, there are opportunities for you to do that. And there are tools that exist to help accomplish that right now. It's not some you know, far off future thing where we need to develop brand new chemistries and breed new grasses and all that sort of stuff. That stuff will be great and that'll be important for us moving forward, uh, but there are some tools that exist to help right now. I also feel that environmental impact should be taken into account along with price and efficacy when selecting, uh, selecting the product. And um, with that, this is my contact information. Uh, feel free to email me at any time with any questions. Every time I give this talk, whether it's <coughs> a professional group or to a public group, I get some great feedback. So I welcome any feedback that you have, positive, positive negative ideas on, on stuff that you'd like to see uh, as part of the initiative. Uh, please do go ahead and either give me a call 
or write me an email. I do have uh, one of our websites up there. I also I oversee a turf diagnostic lab. This turf diagnostic lab, in my mind, is a great IPM tool for managing landscapes. If you have a problem with your lawn, and you want to help, you want help figuring out what it is, rather than kind of just going and spraying a bunch of different pesticides, seeing if that'll work. You can submit a sample or call up uh, our turf grass diagnostic lab, and uh, and and we'll help you work through that problem. And, and typically, uh, with no pesticide recommendations, unless that's unless that's what uh, what best fits what best fits your needs. Uh, we are also working on a common ground initiative website. We're hoping to have that up in uh, in the next week or so. So. With that, I, uh, I thank you again for attending tonight and for your attention. Uh, I'll sign off here, and then I'll stick around if anybody has uh, any more questions. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, you, you mentioned in some of these uh, uh, pesticide cases or herbicide uh, cases, it's uh, very expensive. Now, the reason is it expensive, is it because they're, they're pricing based upon what the market can bear? Or are they pricing it on, this is the cost, plus we're going to make 4% profit or something like this? So why is it so expensive? Well, a couple of reasons. One, they, they are a business, obviously they need to make money. And newer pesticides are always more expensive because they need to try and recoup some of that cost they put in developing the product. Most pesticides to come to the market today uh, take approximately 10 years, anywhere between 275 and 300 million dollars for the company to bring from discovery to market. And so they're going to try and recoup as many of that, as, many, as much of those costs as possible for, before it goes off path. Um, rarely, in, in my experience, I, I'm not a formulation chemist by any means, but for the most part, it's usually based on what the market can bear, what people are going to pay for. Yes, ma'am. In your racetrack uh, part. Experiment. Yep. On the model section, section four. Yes. Clippings removed, clippings mulched. Clippings mulched. Okay. I would always, always recommend mulching clippings, with very few exceptions. I always recommend, always recommend mulching clippings. It adds about a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. And they'll almost usually eliminate one for lesser applications by mulching. So the clippings were mulched, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Either on DDT or other uh, discontinued uh, pesticides, are there any epigenetic studies? Uh, I don't have any specific results, but I know there are epigenetic studies that are, that are done related to pesticides, uh, certainly. Uh, most of them are done on DDT because that is sort of the sort of the model pesticide chemical that most work is still done on today. But I do not have, uh, I haven't seen any publications of those results, but yeah, I know some of those studies have been done. Them. Yeah, I know that. I know some of the guys. I mean, you know, when grandpa and grandma starved back then in the Irish, the one that escaped death, there weren't nice consequences down mm -hmm. the heritage. Yes, agreed. How do you care for your own lawn? <laughs> How do I care for my own lawn? <laughs> <laughs> so what I did actually, so I, uh, like I said before, I lived a few blocks west of Madison, West High, and. Um, we have a fenced-in uh, backyard, and we have a open uh, front yard. And what I did last year is I converted the front yard to a, a low-input grass vine fescue. My fescue as well in the shade has a very low fertility requirement, uh, very low water requirement, and so I seeded that in last fall, and uh, I I spot treated a few weeds last spring in some of the thin areas, and I haven't done anything to it since. It's not a weed-free lawn by any means, but it uh, it's done very well for myself. So again, you know, last last night I was over in Milwaukee doing a master gardener training on kind of introductory lawn care. And the thing that you know that we harp on is that for a for a, a nice yard, not a perfect yard, but a nice yard, it's incredibly important to have the right grass for the right space. So if everybody puts in Kentucky bluegrass and they have shade, that grass is never going to do well. They're going to spray that that yard till till we're out of pesticides and weeds are going to still come back there. So it's important to put the right grass and have the right practices in the right environment, and it all comes back to that IPM. We significantly reduce the reliance on pesticides that we currently have. Um, I was going to ask about different types of turf grass. Yes. Um, we have the, the slow growth, I believe it's the same as the Yes. And I've observed that I have a neighbor who has a, a creeping Charlie lawn. It is 100% creeping Charlie. And uh, 
as long as you have some sort of plant, whether it's fine fescue or another plant that is taking up that soil, there's no place for the other weeds to come in. So really the best defense against weeds is to have that, that dense dense cover. Whatever, if it's, if it's turf, if it's a ground cover, you know, sometimes turf just ain't, ain't the right plant. Uh, and, and sometimes we recommend putting in Pachysandra or you know, which, whatever it is, uh, putting in a different cover. But if you have, if you're covering up those open areas where weeds come in is when we have thin spots. And that's where the weeds come in. My other question was, what turf would be used in your thin spots? That, uh, that turf would have been a mixture of Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass that we did nothing to for a period of several years and eventually it thinned out. So we never fertilized it, we never did anything, we never irrigated it, and over time it thinned out and weeds came in. So Kentucky bluegrass is one of those plants where you do need to provide it some fertility or else over time it's going to thin out. We didn't because we wanted to get weeds for our research. And so that was a mix of bluegrass and ryegrass. Mm -hmm. Todd? Can you tell us about the OJ Nor turfgrass facility? Can you go visit that? Where is it? Or is that where your plots are? Or? The plots are out at the OJ Nor turfgrass research and education facility. OJ Nor is an ARS station. So if anybody's familiar with you know, Arlington or Hancock, uh, any of the other ARS stations, OJ Nor is an a ARS station. Anybody know where University Ridge Golf Course is out on the far west side? Uh, so OJ Nor is, is adjacent to University Ridge. It's the one, uh, the, the, the driveway into the OJ Nor is on the west side of Highway M. You know, if, if you, if you are lucky enough to be going on Highway M more than 25 miles an hour, uh, you can see the OJ Nor just to the right. What, what are you saying, Paul? <laughs> the traffic is bad. I think that's what I'm saying. Uh, does anybody know who OJ Nor is? Actually? All right, so OJ Nor was uh, an agronomist back in the 50s, 60s, maybe even in the 70s at uh, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage, Dist Sewage District, and he was the guy who created the Lord So he was. Uh, Famous, world-renowned for creating. So you, you went through that word really fast. Can you slow down and say Bill Morgan, nice? Bill Morgan. A lot of people say, what? <laughs> I know, it's tough asking Midwesterners to use their consonants. <laughs> I know. I know. Bill Morganites. Bill Morganites. So O'Jenner was the, was the person who created Bill Morganites. And uh, so he was a very famous uh, turf grass agronomist, and so our facility is named after him. We do have demonstration plots of all sorts of different grass species that are open to the public. Uh, we also are a public parking lot for the Ice Age Trail, so if anybody likes to do hiking, it's, it's gorgeous out there along the Ice Age Trail, you can park in the OJ North parking lot. And if you do want to come out and see the demonstration plots of the different turf grass species, I would recommend calling ahead uh, to make sure somebody's there to show you them, otherwise you're going to be kind of wandering aimlessly around, uh, around uh, the research facility. So we would like that. How is that there. different than the research? <laughs> very, very sweet point. Tom clearly has been in academia. So. Uh, and uh, typically open 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. Uh, the phone number for the OG Nor is 608-845. Oh, heck. 2632. Uh, yeah, yeah, call that. See, see who picks up. I believe it's 2632. 8452. And can you tell a little bit about this? I didn't realize that O.J. Nor had nothing to do with the university and that he was Mr. Malorganite. Well, he, was a, he was a graduate of UW, though, as well, um, I believe. Okay. Can you tell about the Malorganite story, what it is, and then about the controversy about 40 years ago as to whether it was uh, had heavy metals in it? That type of so Malorganite is basically um, Milwaukee sewage sludge that is purified and, and, and cleaned and and then uh, dried and, and used as fertilizer. And it used to be one of the most popular fertilizers in the world. Uh, I talked with the former superintendent at Maple Bluff Country Club <coughs> over near the governor's mansion over there. And he used to order malorganite by the train car load. Okay, so that, that was how popular this fertilizer used to be. It's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a natural fertilizer. It's not considered OMRI uh, certified, but it is a natural fertilizer. And the controversy was back in the, I think the 70s and the 80s, back when Milwaukee had all their heavy industries, that there was a lot of uh, heavy uh, toxic metals that were in that, uh, in that fertilizer. And uh, their sales dropped off uh, considerably uh, after some of that controversy. And, and, and there is still quite a bit of malorganite used. I, I, you know, I think we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick with more uh, interest in, in more natural fertilizers again, but it was a, a significant controversy for them. But it was a huge uh, profit center for the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District for a, a long period of time with uh, with the development of that of that fertilizer and finding something to do with their sewage sludge. So 
But we've had several other communities try and replicate it, and none have been able to be as successful as Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. If you were going to give a gift of a pesticide to your neighbor with the Creeping Charlie <laughs> problem, what would it be? Well, Creeping Charlie is an extremely difficult, it's the hardest weed, in my opinion, that, that, is, that there is to control in a Wisconsin lawn. So I, my question would be, um, my response would be, so there's this, this uh, Twitter account, and it's called uh, Four Letter Word Academic Say, stuff, but not the word stuff, Academic Say. And a couple weeks ago, they had a joke up. And the joke was, what does one academic say to the other? And the answer was, it depends. All right, so they, my answer to your question is, is it depends. So how much do they want to get rid of Creepy Charlie, and what do they want to use to do it? Far away, the most effective method for, for eliminating that Creepy Charlie is to buy that three-way mixture and apply it right now, after, the, after our first good hard frost. That is the most effective way to do it. If you don't want to use that three-way mixture, it becomes much more difficult. Uh, typically, we're going to be applying, uh, you, can, you can use that, uh, that Defender or that Confront herbicide, and you're going to be applying several times throughout the year. Usually, the fall is best after that first frost, but you can apply multiple times throughout the year. Uh, if it's a serious, significant infestation, it might be better to just uh, till up and start over again, because it's going to be very difficult to get a lot of that out of there. It's a very difficult weed. It's an aggressive, stoloniferous, fast-growing weed. <laughs> I mean, she knows. <laughs> Any other questions? Tom? Um, at Stoughton, mowing, how do they mow the four different fields? Are they all mowed at the same height? All fields are mowed at the same height. So that field is the only one, the field that's mow only, that they just mow, that's the only one that is mowed only. But they're all mowed at the same time, the same height, all that. So when Doug was here a couple of years ago, he said, uh, three things, two of which I can remember. Um, one is fertilizer is herbicide, especially nitrogen. The other is um, mow high, and I think the third one was mow sharp. And if you sounds like that. Um, and I can do all of them. <laughs> I love mowing high. Um, so I'm still okay. <laughs> somewhere between two and a half and three and a half inches. And can you get away with that on ballparks? Uh, for, I would say certainly two and a half. Uh, three and a half might be getting a little bit shaggy, might be getting some complaints on that, but two and a half I think is, is, is definitely doable. And do they use a real, like a lawn? Uh, They'll use a, -E they use a rotary mower out there. It's going around the one that goes around the circle, not the multiple blades that, that, okay. that goes that night. Which do you recommend? Uh, well, I mean, it depends. Uh, but and, you know, for the most case, for most uh, cases, a rotary mower is fine. We want to keep that blade sharp. Um, but the rotary mower is, is simpler. It's a, it's a blade that goes around in a circle. If it gets dull, you unscrew it. You either sharpen it yourself. If you have a file at home, or you take it to the hardware store. They spend five minutes sharpening it. A real mower, and we see more and more people just to hand push real mowers. Those things are hard to sharpen. Uh, you cannot sharpen those on your own because you, there's multiple blades. You need to make sure they're sharpened at the right angle so they're still coming into that into contact with that bed knife at the right angle to cut the turf. So, so rotary mowers are just much more simple, and I, that's what we almost always recommend for, for the homeowner. Um, anybody else? Because I got one more. <laughs> so the squeaky wheel. You, you mentioned and you, you specifically used the phrase, we don't know whether this is what the people of Stoughton will want. And I, from my point of view, I wish it was that easy because it's not just what the majority of people want. It's often ruled by a vociferous 4 or 5 or 6%. Um, as an extension person, how do you deal with the idea that a vociferous 4 or 5 or 6% might have anxieties or concerns that aren't necessarily real well common in the data, and that kind of swamps um, a far larger percentage of people who would be happy to have a yeah, I mean, Tom, what we try to do is we try and, and, and meet in the middle on as many factors as we possibly can. We're not gonna we're not gonna make everybody in so happy, even with that that IPM program. There's still a synthetic pesticide that's gonna be used. 
So there's still that four or five percent that's going to demand that they go pesticide free. But so what we try to take into account is is the entire community. So we want to take into account as much of the public as we can. We also need to take into account what the city is doing because the city needs to is going to be the one spending the money on the program. So that's what we try to do. And, and, and it's not just with Stone. We've done this with a number of individuals on their own homes. We've done this with a number of uh, condo associations around Dane County where we get one person who comes in, they're very concerned about pesticide usage on that facility, and they want no pesticides applied. So what we've done, in almost every case, we meet somewhere in the middle, right? We, we target certain, we make a plan, we're gonna target certain areas of the condo, they're gonna be high priority. Same thing that we would do with Stoughton. We, we target certain areas of certain parks that are high priority, they're gonna get the most attention. Out of the way areas of the park, they might not need as much attention as the other parts. Um, as we come and we do that, we compromise somewhere on the use of the product. We recommend a product that is going to work, uh, one that the city can afford, and, and one that uh, has a, a lower impact. And so you're, you're, you're exactly right that, um, that there's always going to be that, that very vocal uh, minority. And we want to alleviate some of their concerns. Certainly, we, we want to address some of their concerns. And in every situation that we've worked in, we've, we've left where each side is somewhat comfortable with the decision that we've come to, right? Everybody's not thrilled, but everybody has given up something and, and gotten something in return, and they've seen a, a change made in the management program. And that's, that's, as an extension person, that's what we, we try and do, is we try and um, come, kind of, to use the initiative, kind of come to a common ground and, and bring everybody in, into the middle. And we've been successful in that in every case that we've done so far. Uh, DeForest was another one we worked with with the school, school board up there on a plan for school. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. All right. Thank you.